What's up gang, Dead Girl here. Hope you guys are having an amazing day today. Um, this video that I'm about to do for you fine folks, it comes to you courtesy of a very cool wrestler, super nice guy known as Risen. Um, if you're not following him on his social media outlets, be sure to do so. I'm going to link him down below in the description box. So Risen has compiled a book and this lovely book is called Hell of, Con Hell of a Confession. <laughs> Sorry. Here you go. He was cool enough to send me a copy so that I could have a little read through. Now these are short stories compiled by some of his fans confessing their sins to him or bragging about it in some of the cases. This book is something that if you are a good moral person is probably going to make you angry when you read it. Some of the stories in it made me a little angry when I read it, I'm not going to lie. And other stories, I kind of chuckled a little and kind of went along the lines of like, I wish I would have thought of that. Um, I'm not going to tell you which ones those are though. But along with sending me this book, he also sent me this cool little bracelet. It says Risen on it and it says I Confessed on the back and it's got a little, uh, couple pentagrams on there. It's a fun little bracelet. And he also sent me this drawing. Now I'm going to apologize because when I opened the package, I kind of slid into it. So I'm really sorry. But he also sent me this cool little drawing here, which is very, very Scooby-Doo-ish. And I totally love it. Big Scooby-Doo fan. So if you combine Risen with Scooby-Doo, I'm all for it. So that's kind of what this is. Now, I wanted to read you guys an excerpt from his book. So it's story time with the dead girl. <laughs> now, the story that I'm going to read to you today is called My Blood Restored the Ouija Board? Question mark. Now, this story comes from Plymouth, Massachusetts. This story is approximately about four or five pages long. Um, like I said, this book is an excerpt has excerpts um, from different stories of things that are not so nice that people did. So this is one that I kind of felt would be appropriate to read to you guys. Um, so without further ado, here we go. All right, so here we go. Story time with the dead girl. All right, once again, the title, My Blood Restored, The Ouija Board. I would awaken at night and there it was. Grandma's house was old. More so, Grandma's house was cold. I mentioned it to her on those nights when I felt so. It was terribly dark at dusk. The sunlight would become absent much quicker from her residence. So dark that oftentimes there seemed to be something lingering in the distant corners of my eye when I was looking away to the television or reading a book, or was I just an imaginative child? The lack of illumination in her house was always eerie. I was already quite easily spooked as a child. I could hardly sleep alone. Night terrors were always a big part of my childhood, but they were much worse when I moved in with my grandmother. There were many times in those moments that I would imagine myself somewhere else, somewhere away from her house, but I couldn't because I was stuck. It was either her or the foster care system. She took me in and I was forever grateful. It's not like I wasn't comforted by her because I was. When she was around, I felt fine but in the back of my mind, I was always afraid. One night we watched a couple television shows and she turned the TV off. She was old fashioned, old fashioned in the sense that she felt too much TV would warp my mind. Now, I've heard that growing up as a kid. I don't know about you guys. So that, that little line strikes familiar with me. So does grandma's creepy old house. I mean, there's always been those houses that we grew up in. They're always a little, little eerie. Back to the story. Tonight, instead of television, I have a plan, she told me. She walked over to the darkness of her closet and opened the door. The creak of the old door was enough to make my neck hair stand up, but knew she was nearby, so I was okay. She turned on a flashlight. The light flickered a few times as she struck the back of the flashlight with her palm a couple of times, till a steady stream of light came out of the top of it. When I got custody of you, 
I bought some board games at the local thrift stop. I thought we could play one tonight, she continued. I played a lot of board games with your mom and her sister, as well as my late husband. Now I can continue the tradition with you. That's really sweet. She sat down sitting, she sat down setting the stack of old mishap and boxes of the games she collected on the coffee table in the living room. One by one, she read them off. Monopoly, Clue, Checkers, Chess, and some off-brand games I couldn't recall. And then wedged in the middle of all those, laid a brown, dusty game box. She pulled it from the stack and tried to pronounce it. Ouija? She struggled and handed the box to me to look over as she pursued the other games. As I held the game, an eerie feeling washed over me. An image of a person I had never seen flashed in my head. It was a man but no ordinary man. He looked devilish, and he had the most sinister smile. I was entranced with the creepy-looking man, completely ignoring the fact that my grandma was trying to get my attention. Chinese checkers? She asked. No response. Grandson, I said Chinese checkers! Again, I was in my own head, and I couldn't hear her. She snatched the box out of my hand to try and get my attention, and the box spilled open, tossing old papers, the board, and the planchette all over the floor. I snapped out of it and turned to her. Chinese checkers is fine. Okay now, clean up this board game and help grandma set up this one. I knelt and grabbed at the faded pieces of paper and pieces of the Ouija board. I felt uneasy just touching the game and rapidly shoved it all back in the box when suddenly slice. My finger must have grazed one of the old sheets of paper and gave me a nasty paper cut. The drip of blood rolled down the edge of the box, and I immediately did what every young boy would do and stuck my bloody finger in my mouth, you know, to clean it. The taste of my blood or finger, the taste of my blood or finger was less than appetizing and didn't taste like me, if that makes sense. My grandma ripped a finger from my mouth and marched me into the sink to clean it up. I guess with the mess we made and the bloody paper cut you received, we should just skip the board game and call it a night. I shrugged. I guess. She cleaned me up, bandaged my finger, and gently took my hand. She led me to my room and ushered me into the deep sleep. She would sing to me old sweet country songs, melodic and almost enchanting. I forgot the loneliness of my room, which was on the opposite end of her, the house, to hers, and I dripped it off into the cozy arms of sleep. I laid there asleep, comfortably until an overwhelming nightmare took over my slumber. All these sweet dreams I was having were lost when this nightmare began. My mind was brought back to earlier, where I inserted my finger into my mouth to stop the bleeding. However, this time the blood filled my mouth, pooling and rising until my cheeks swelled about to explode. I took my finger out of my mouth and like a volcanic eruption, the blood oozed from me. I turned to yell for help, but I was muted. And there was the same man that flashed in my mind earlier. He was smiling at my misery. I let out a scream and woke myself up, shaking profusely from the horrors of my sleep. I looked down at my beige pillowcase, and to my shock, the pillowcase was soiled with blood. I hardly slept that night, or any night thereafter. The next day, and subsequent days after, the light would break through the crack of the curtains. I would sit up, thankful that it was daytime, and that I could just get out of bed. The pillows, the visions, the torturous nightmares, they never stopped. But once daybreak came, it was like they never happened. I tried a couple of times to explain the torment, but it fell on deaf ears. It's not that my grandma wasn't caring. She was godly and just would teach me ways to cope with the dreams, such as a little prayer before bedtime. As I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. She felt it would help me find peace in the night but quite the opposite. I always felt it was basically giving this demonic man of my sleep permission to kill me since I have now asked God to take my soul if I die overnight. I tried the prayers. They didn't work. I tried a radio. Didn't work. I stopped. My violent video games. And guess what? That didn't work. No matter the method, no matter how hard I tried to get a good night's sleep, he was there to infect me. I would doze off on occasion, likely from sheer exhaustion, and within minutes my eyes would be forced open, awoken by the sensation of an oppression around my nasal passage, and the diluted oxygen of the room, which smelt like rotten eggs. 
I would look around my room and always his figure would appear. The smile he would give me as I lay visibly tormented was absolutely horrendous. This happened every night for many months. Finally, my grandmother took my place seriously. After seeing how emaciated I had become from nights of throwing up from fear and simple lack of sleep, she moved me to the couch, which was closer to her room, and lit an oil lamp next to the couch so I'd have a little light through the night. I got a couple of good nights rest on the couch. Finally. I was starting to become more comfortable with sleep. I felt like the fears and night terrors were subsided, but I was wrong. Perhaps the being just didn't know where I was off to. Perhaps he just needed me to physically well rested because he came back days later. I was sleeping peacefully on the couch and I felt a cold breeze crawl across my body and the blanket removed from me as I shivered myself awake. I reached for a blanket and standing above me was this demonic man yet again. This time, he was not smiling. Much meaner and much worse, the being growled and its eyes exuded with a powerful steamy sizzle. Its amber orbs were like windows that led into an inexistent soul, shone in the dark with readiness to bring agony to all that it faced, and the eternity of its body were merged with greater blackness of the room. I screamed, well, so I thought I screamed, but no one could hear me. I couldn't even hear myself beg for help. My heart raced as the being snarled at me, intimidating me. I tried to ask what he wanted from me, and this time he spoke. He spoke something like this. You opened up a box that didn't belong to you. The letters inside from people who would write down the questions I was answering for them. A trick to free my soul, but they never took my request seriously. They would ask me questions, write my answers, and put it all back in the box. I decided to abandon them. The next time they played with the spirit board, I ignored them. Boredom overtook them, and they put me away, never to play again. I was set within the confines of the box and had been trapped there until I tasted the blood of you. With that taste of blood, I crept inside that brain of yours. And now I'm a part of you. Now, if you want those tears to stop, I need you to do something for me. A soul for your sanity, kill for me. Kill for me and I will kill for you. Wait, let me write that. Kill for me or I will kill for me as you. I just knew this was a nightmare. It couldn't be real. Yet I had the with or what? Yet I had the withdrawal to vehemently, vehemently deny his request. Deny his request. All right, hold on. This word is tripping me up. Sorry. I swear I can read. I promise. All right, let me restart that line again. I just knew this was a nightmare and couldn't be real. Yet I had to withdraw to vehemently deny his request. He grabbed my face and pried my mouth open. His mouth yelled out a screeching sound, making it uncomfortable to hear. His body seemingly melted down into a liquid. My eyes rolled into the back of my head as the putrid taste filled my mouth. The elixir was foul, and it gagged me into nearly puking. It was relentless in its deposit, and then it stopped. It all stopped. I felt alone, but scared yet again. I had wanted to scream from the sheer terror of the sight I had just witnessed and felt, but my voice had departed from me. Then, just then, the calmness sent in. The moments that followed the panic, that panic changed. My senses faded and suddenly I felt free. I felt at peace, almost deathlike. An overwhelming serenity rendered my brain thoughtless. What happened? I will never know for sure, but that calmness was abruptly shaken into another hysteria. My eyes widened and my ears rattled by the piercing sound of sirens. I could not bring myself to understand how I had been brought to a, to a scenery of a vehicular red flashing light surrounding noise and grandma whimpering by my side. I felt my own arm. I realized it had been strapped to a stretcher, being escorted out of that old, surrounded by medical aid. Being escorted out of the old house, surrounded by medical aid. Mm. <laughs> you will be fine, grandma murmured to me, grief choking force from her tone that she noticed the panic in my eyes. What's happening? I screamed with tears rolling down my face. Medics rushed me to an ambulance, ignoring my questions. The rest of the night was a blur. Perhaps I was sedated. 
for my own good or theirs. Blood tests, seclusions, blood tests ensued in a closed off medical center. CTs, brain scans, cross examinations, and more. Time passed through the night and finally they came in, discharged me, and I leapt into my grandma's arms. I was so damn scared. Grandma later broke down after I battered her with questions and reported to me that I had behaved abnormally by the front room where she had discovered me rocking back and forth, head tilted back in a seizure-like state. She stated she called out to me, and I answered, however, the tone of my voice was that of a more sinister disposition. I threatened her and expressed my need to kill and asked her for a knife. She said the voice was not mine, and I was often talking in gibberish, speaking in tongues, perhaps. She panicked and cursed me, she panicked and cursed me out, telling me she was bound to call the cops. I threatened her yet again, stating if she dared to pick up the phone, it would be the last thing she ever did. She says she backed off and told me she wouldn't call the authorities, which calmed me for the moment. She quickly left the room and used the phone next to her bed to alert 911. I sat there puzzled and in shock, disbelief even. I don't recall anything, she stated. Then she said this, the doctors found nothing wrong with you. After all the tests, they couldn't keep you any longer. They chalked up the episode to a bad dream, or you just acting out they, since, being, since you were being in my care. I know that wasn't the case. What you demonstrated to me was that of pure evil. I was devastated. I'm a good person. I always have been. I was brought home, and Grandma stayed longer with me than she ever had before. Well, before the first incident. She often would fall asleep in the chair next to the couch. The torment of the demon never got to that point again, but the night terror stayed frequent for months. I would yell for her, telling her I was stuck, telling her the man had my hands, screaming that he was trying to take over my soul again. She braved those nightmares and sat with me. She placed a clothed, a clothed cloth on my head, prayed and cuddled me until it subsided. I was possessed, I'm sure of it. Eventually, I defeated it by consent consistently telling it to go away in my dreams. He had become powerless over time and I began sleeping again. I moved out a few short years later and back to my parents. They had cleaned up their act enough to win me back into their lives. My grandmother and I never spoke about the incidents. It's like those months never even existed. I know it sounds crazy, but I maintain I was entrapped in a demonic possession. Not once, but consistently at a young age. Was it just a wild imagination? No way in hell. Until this confession, I never spoke of it again. Honestly, because who would believe me? I experienced the phenomena known as a demonic possession and overcame it before it took a permanent hold on me. I was finally brave enough to put it all out on paper. It feels good just to tell the story. I feel a relief, like I just let another demon out from inside of me. So that's the story of some demonic possession. My blood restored the Ouija board. Um, again, this comes from a person in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And this is part of a series of stories in Risen's book, Hella Confessions. Um, again, I'm gonna link all this down below so you guys can purchase this if you want one for you. I really enjoyed that story. That's one of my favorites out of the book. Um, then again, I'm, I like ghosts and scary stuff, so of course that one appealed to me. There's a couple of other things that are in there that are just downright crude. Um, <laughs> some things that people do are pretty crappy, and you're going to find some of them in this book. So thank you guys so much for joining Storytime with Dead Girl, as I'm calling this. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and until next time, make sure that you keep it spooky.